So I'm Mike Breen, a public awareness officer for the American Mathematical Society, and I'm talking with Eugenia Cheng, who is a scientist or the scientist in residence at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an honorary visiting fellow at City uh, University of London. And Eugene is also the author of two books, one of which uh, relates exactly to the math moment here, uh, and that's How to Bake Pie, an edible exploration of the mathematics of mathematics. And she's also the author of the recent book, uh, X Plus Y, a Mathematician's Manifesto for Rethinking Gender. And we'll talk about both of those. Uh, so Eugenia, thanks for talking with me. Uh, uh, with, regard to, uh, with regard to cooking, uh, you know, one thing that I ran across was the difference between uh, volume and uh, weight when it comes to recipes, uh, and which uh, was a, a, a revelation to me. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's something that's quite a cultural difference, actually. I grew up in the UK, and by the time I was baking, it, everyone was weighing things, really. But here in the US, it's still quite prevalent that people use cup measures for baking. And the thing is, as you say, that one is volume and one is weight. Well, um, in fact, what we're really trying to measure is mass. And when we weigh things, the thing is that weight is quite a good proxy for mass because the only difference is involved is gravity. And that tends to be constant when we're baking. You know, if we were baking on a spaceship that was accelerating wildly, then it wouldn't be such a good proxy. Whereas with volume, there's the issue of density involved. And so it really depends because you can pack things into a cup measure in all sorts of different ways. If you really squash your flour in, then you'll get loads more flour than if you sort of vaguely heap it up. And if you're a bit um, over generous with your heap of heaping cup, then you'll get way more sugar than if you just sort of gently heap things up. So it doesn't matter that much for recipes that aren't terribly subtle or nuanced, but sometimes baking is, is quite a lot of chemistry involved in it. And so the, the chemical interactions depend quite subtly on the exact amounts that you have. And so for some things like oatmeal, oatmeal is not quite so subtle, so it probably doesn't matter and cup measures will be fine. But for things like cake or the most delicate subtle thing I've ever tried to bake, which is French macaron, then you really need to weigh things because a little tiny bit in either direction can make the whole thing fail. And in fact, even further than that, ounces aren't that great either because ounces are kind of enormous, whereas grams are much more delicate and finely tuned. And sometimes it's just two or three grams either way that can make a difference. And an ounce is 28 grams, it's enormous. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but that is a perfect number. So that's a nice uh, coincidence for our math. Uh, now, uh, so, in terms of the U.S., where, where I grew up and where I am now, uh, so it's, uh, we're behind both in terms of not being metric and uh, using uh, volumes instead of mass or, or weight, right? Well, far be it from me to say that someone is behind somebody else. <laughs> right. there, there are many traditions involved, and cups are, it's very handy if you don't have the equipment, and uh, if you understand ratios between things, then that can be handy because it doesn't really matter how big your cup is. It doesn't have to be an official cup. As long as you use the same cup, then the ratios will be the same. And that's quite a fun fact. So if you understand, for example, with, with oatmeal, I think it's one to two, and then no matter what size of cup you use, it's still going to be one to two. You just will get more or less oatmeal overall. So there are, there are pros and cons to the, the different methods. And I think that's one of the things I like to say about math all the time is that it's not, it's often not that one thing is right and one thing is wrong, but there are different situations in which different things are more helpful. And I think in general in life, that can be a, a good thing to think about rather than just some one person's right and one person's wrong, which leads to the situation where in the world with very divisive situations and people yelling at each other saying, no, I'm right. No, I'm right. Whereas we can go, well, okay. And, and what, in, in what sense is this thing good? And in what sense is this other thing helpful? And what are we trying to help with right now? Uh, so, so that brings up a good point. And so uh, me would be starting a fight because I, say, I was saying we were behind. Uh, so uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, but you, you've, you've talked about, when you talk about your book, you mentioned that in a lot of times math people say, oh, that's one right answer, very precise. Follow, you know, follow the recipe, you might say. Uh, but that's not how uh, math advances. Right, and there are a lot of parallels with math and cooking here because cooking 
if you if you take a class or something it might seem like you have to follow the recipe and that it's not imaginative or creative because you're just following these steps that someone else has given you but i think most of us find that if we do enjoy cooking then the thing that's really fun is making things up for ourselves to suit our own tastes and maybe starting with somebody else's recipe and then adjusting it according to what we like and it really helps in that situation to understand the principles of cooking so that you know that, for example, something might make the egg curdle so that you don't want to do that. But sometimes you want something to curdle deliberately if you're trying to sour your milk, for example, in order to make something that requires that, that sourness. Um, and in math, it's the same kind of thing that math as it's taught in classes is often a lot about rules that someone imposes on you. And that's a shame because then it can seem like it's not creative and that it doesn't involve imagination. Whereas we know that in research math, it's all about creating things. And in fact, it's about experimenting with probably starting with something that someone has done before and then maybe modifying it or generalizing it or, or changing one part a little bit. Of course, if you change everything too much, then you get a contradiction and everything implodes. And so it's still good to know, understand the principles involved so that you can understand what it is you're trying to generalize or adjust. And in both of those situations, I think it's a shame that many people grow up with the idea that it's all about rules you have to follow instead of being, being given the opportunities earlier on to experiment and play around. And especially with math, there aren't, there aren't really terrible consequences. You know, it's not, it's not, dangerous nothing it's not like if if we let people just get in a car without teaching them how to drive and just said okay well you experiment driving up the street that that has consequences whereas playing around with math it doesn't doesn't really have consequences yes if you're going to go and build a bridge or a plane eventually you, you do need to know the actual math of that so that that the consequences are good but i think at school it would be really beneficial to allow children more of that playing around. And so are there any other major parallels between cooking and math that you'd like to talk about that we might have missed before we talk about your latest book? Yes, I love the fact that baking especially, which is I love baking the most, and I love pure math. I'm a pure mathematician. And I love the fact that you take basic ingredients and you can do something fantastic with them and it turns into something that's very unlike the ingredients you started with. So it's all about the process. For example, if you take eggs and butter and flour and sugar, it makes cake. And cake is very unlike any of those basic ingredients. Whereas if you make something like, I don't know, ribs. I love ribs. You take ribs, you cook them, and they, they sort of look like ribs before you start. And in the end, they kind of also look like ribs. They're just cooked. And I, I love cooking ribs, but there's something to me that's more magic about the process of taking very basic ingredients and making something with a complicated process. And I'm always someone who prefers a recipe with a small number of ingredients and a complicated process rather than a huge list of ingredients where you just sort of put them all in a pot and leave them there for several hours, which is, it's, it can also be delicious. But that to me reminds me of pure math where you start with things that are trying to be as fundamental and basic as possible and see what you can do with the process rather than taking mathematical gadgets that are already quite complicated and, and applying them, which is also wonderful. I'm not trying to denigrate it. It's just my personal taste is that, and that's why I'm a pure mathematician and that's why I love baking most of all. It's the magic of the process. And if it's presented too mysteriously, then it can just seem like it's strange and we don't know where it came from but if we can enjoy the magic of that process and and marvel at it then i think that's wonderful